Have you ever wondered how to apply capital budgeting techniques in the real world? In the textbook, the way you learn about capital budgeting techniques is very outcome oriented. In the real world business operation, capital budgeting is much more practical and constraints oriented. Let me show you what I mean by that and share some of the insights from working with capital intensive businesses. Capital budgeting techniques help rank investment project opportunities. We have six projects to choose from in this example. If you rank the projects based on the payback method, then you start with the project that claims to have the shortest payback period, which is the most attractive, and end with the project that has the longest payback period, which is the least attractive. If you rank the projects based on the net present value method, which takes the time value of money into account, then you start with the project that creates the highest amount of value, which is the most attractive, and end with the project that creates the lowest amount of value, which is the least attractive. If you rank the project based on internal rate of return, then you start with the project that promises the highest percentage return, which is the most attractive, and end with the project that promises the lowest percentage return, which is the least attractive. So where do we go from here? Which is better? A shorter payback period? A higher NPV? Or a higher RR? Well, it depends. First, how much investment budget is being requested and how much CAPEX budget is available. The six projects, in our example, add up to a requested $130 million. The CAPEX budget that the company makes available for the current year is $100 million. That's actually a good thing. It's nice to have more projects available than what you can fund. So how does a company come up with $100 million CAPEX budget for the year? I have seen companies relate their CAPEX budget to their expected revenue. $100 million could be 5% of $2 billion in revenue. Others might relate CAPEX to free cash flow. If the expected cash from operating activities is $300 million, and the target free cash flow for the year is $200 million, then as a result, there is $100 million available for capital expenditures. On top of that, company leadership might specify that the CapEx budget has to be split 50-50 between productivity projects and growth projects. Productivity as in cost savings, primarily to increase the gross margin percentage. Growth projects as in revenue growth, as the stock market places a huge premium on high growth versus low growth companies. The first three projects on our list are productivity projects. A lot of companies rank these based on the payback method with a cutoff. For example, selecting the most attractive projects as long as they have a payback within three years. Why would you use the payback method for productivity projects? It's because most productivity projects have the same format. In return for an upfront investment of X dollars, we expect Y dollars of annual savings. Investing to automate a part of the production process in return for a headcount reduction, for example. Benefits tend to be the same for each year in the project scope. Simply divide X by Y and you have the expected payback period. Using this approach, project L is eliminated as its payback is longer than three years even though MPV and IRR are more attractive than Project M. That's our selection of $50 million worth of productivity projects done. We now have $110 million worth of projects competing for $100 million of CapEx budget. The other three projects on our list are growth projects. These tend to be evaluated on MPV and IRR, as project benefits are likely to grow over time, and timing becomes very important. The payback method wouldn't do them justice. Net present value and internal rate of return often point you in the same direction in terms of ranking projects from most attractive to least attractive. The ranking for our growth projects is N, P and then O. However, that doesn't resolve our problem of having $50 million available for $60 million worth of growth projects. That's where the very practical aspect of timing comes in. Each CapEx project has an engineering phase and a construction phase. Let's assume for the project in our list that all of the actual spending happens in the construction phase. 
for our projects, the engineering is either already done, takes one quarter to get done, or two quarters to get done. For construction, we either need one quarter, two quarters, or four quarters. We have already eliminated project L from the race, as it did not meet the payback requirement of maximum three years. For the remaining projects, let's see how we can time the projects over the year and hopefully get to an even split of the $100 million of CapEx budget into four quarters of $25 million each. Project K and O are available for immediate launch, with Project K having the most attractive payback period out of the list of productivity projects, and Project O the least attractive MPV and IRR out of the list of growth projects. Let's certainly put Project K in for Q1. To finish allocating our $50 million that's available for productivity projects, let's put $15 million each in Q3 and Q4 for Project M. The ranking of our growth projects is N, P and then O. Let's get Project N done in Q2. For Project P, we start in Q3 and continue in Q4 and create $10 million of carryover into the next year, as the project takes four quarters to construct. Having the carryover of project spending into next year splits Project P into Phase 1 and Phase 2, with Phase 1 going to this year's CapEx budget and Phase 2 into next year's. This limits our CapEx spending for the current year to the $100 million that is available. We still have room to do Project O as well this year, even though it is the least attractive of the three growth projects. For Q1, we now expect to have $25 million in CapEx spending. Q2 25, Q3 25, Q4 25. Wonderful. 